Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We are in a summer series called Stories of Jesus, and we're going to jump right into our text today because this is going to kind of be a little bit of a longer one. I really want to dissect a story in the book of Mark called The Rich Young Ruler. Anybody ever heard that story? The Rich Young Ruler? Okay. I believe that it has been misquoted, it has been abused uh, to taint the idea of what this guy actually went through and what Jesus was saying. I'm going to tell you this. It's very easy to, to make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. Huh? There's a lot of pastors and preachers who, who twist the scripture to, to push their own agenda and what they want. But I want to do a study today of this. Is that all right? The rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler story starts a little bit different than you might guess. Are you ready for this? In Mark 10, 13, it says this. Then they brought little children to Jesus that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, let the children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. We're going to come back to that statement. Look what he said here. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them in his arms, he laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. You may be saying, Pastor Mike, how is that the story of the rich young ruler? Well, it's part of this whole story. Now, as he was going on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered him and said, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. He's very excited. Yes, I've done all these things. Then Jesus looked, looking at him, loved him. That's important, we're going to come back to that. Jesus looking at him, loved him and said, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up your cross and follow me. But he was sad at Jesus' word. And he went away sorrowfully, for he had great possession. Let's break this down. Isn't it interesting that the story of the rich young ruler is directly on the heels of the story of children coming to Jesus. And is it interesting that he says, you got to come to me like these children. And maybe this rich young ruler didn't come that way. We're going to marry these two stories together. We're going to break this down and see why they're together. Okay, let's begin reading in verse 17. It says, now as he was going on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked, good teacher, what shall I do? that I may inherit eternal life. Obviously, this man was not just a disinterested bystander. He wasn't just seeing Jesus for the very first time. He had heard stories. He had heard rumors. He knew what Jesus was talking about. He knew what eternal life was. He knew that Jesus was preaching the fulfillment of the law. And he runs for everything he's worth. He puts all his energy to approach Jesus. And he's eager and he says, how can I inherit eternal life? What do I have to do? He comes eagerly, he comes willingly, he comes with respect and honor. He kneels down, he bows before him, a form of worship. He falls at his knees and he addresses him, good teacher. In another translation, it may say good rabbi. Good rabbi, what must I do? Now, I want to pause for a moment and talk to you about this idea of a rabbi. 
A rabbi is one who held an office of pastor or religious leader, and it was one of the highest, most distinguished, honorable positions that you could hold in the Jewish community. Now, it was a custom in the Jewish home that any time a father, the patriarch of the family, would enter a room, his children were required to stand in respect for, his, for their father entering the room. Could you imagine that? I mean, I don't even get a nod when I enter the room anymore, right? <laughs> My kids don't even look about at their phone, let alone stand up, right? But if dad walked in the room, all the kids had to stand up. It was a form of honor. But there was one exception. There was one exception to that rule. If a son had become a rabbi, when the son entered the room, the father would stand up and show respect and honor to the son. That's how high this position or elevated office of rabbi was. So it is with great respect and with great honor that this rich young ruler is approaching Jesus and he's saying, good rabbi. He's, he's saying, you hold this high office, a good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And I will tell you, Going into this study, I had a lot of beliefs about this rich young ruler that I could not prove to be correct. I believe this rich young ruler to be very arrogant and prideful and try to buy his right into heaven. My, 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 my philosophy of this has changed the more I've studied this. I want to look at this. The psalmist in the Old Testament talks about inheriting life, and so often in the Old Testament, the notion of inheriting eternal life was based upon obedience to the Mosaic law. This man was coming under the assumption that he could inherit eternal life by keeping the law, by his behavior, by being a good person. He comes and says, I've kept all the rules, I've kept all the laws, I deserve eternal life. But this is how he approaches Jesus. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And let's notice how Jesus answers him, and I love how Jesus answers almost every single person that ever asks him a question. Jesus almost always answers a question with a question. If you want to be a really good leader or boss, ask a lot of questions. And when your people ask you a question, ask them a question back. Make them come up with the answer. Don't just give people answers. Make them come up with the answer. He says, why are you calling me good? Don't you know that there is only one who is good, even God? Now, Jesus was not saying to the man, why do you call me good? I'm not good, only God is good. That's not what he's saying, okay? There's a lot of debate over this one sentence. Uh, many theologians are split on this, that they're saying, see, Jesus is admitting he's not God, and others are saying, no, that's not at all what he's admitting, and I'm on that side. Jesus is not admitting that he's not good. He's simply saying, why are you calling me good? Only God is good. Are you recognizing me as God, or are you recognizing me as a good teacher? Because if you only see me as a good teacher, you think you're a good man, then we're equals. Huh? Did we get this? See, if Jesus is only a good man, a good teacher, then you could be a good person and get to heaven. But being a good person is not good enough to inherit eternal life. Jesus knew that this man had no idea who he was talking to. He had no idea that he was talking to God incarnate. He did not know that he was talking to Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. This man, to this man, Jesus at best was a good rabbi. So at best, he's elevating him to that office. 
I'll give you rabbi. But Lord, no. I'll give you a good rabbi. But Messiah, no. And this is just like the world today. It's so easy for us. Now follow me here. It is so easy for us to call each other good. He's a good man. She's a good woman. He's a good child. That's a, he's a really good dad. How, how do you preface that? How do you define someone who's a good dad? Because I know dads. I know men. Every single one of us, when you ask us if we're a good dad, we're going to say, I could have been better. I could have been a better dad. I could have paid more attention. I could have been around more. Maybe I didn't have to work so much. I think especially if you're the empty nester and you're looking back at the 18 to 20 years that you did have with each of your kids and now they're grown and gone, they're out of the house and you're just kind of like, did I do enough? Did I equip them enough? Right? So we could go around and say, oh man, he's a good man. She's a good woman. She's a good mom. But how do you quantify good? Were they a good provider? Were they good with their attention? Were they good with their time? What is good? And good is a relative term. And good is only understandable when it's compared to someone else. I'm a good person compared to a bad person. I'm a good dad compared to the absentee father. Does, like, how do you define good? What metric and what standard are we quantifying good. Now Jesus knows by the Holy Spirit that this rich young ruler is about to ask for eternal life based upon him being good. He's about to ask for eternal life based upon his ability to keep the law. Have I lost you yet? Okay. By being good, he believes he should receive eternal life. Jesus is saying, you're calling me good, but there is only one good, and that's God. Are you calling me God, or are you calling me good? I just want, I'm going to ask that to the room, like, is Jesus good, or is Jesus God? Is Jesus Lord in your life, or is he just a good prophet, a good teacher, a good person? Before God, now follow me, this is a little Calvinist, but I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not a Calvinist, but I just want you to follow me here. Before God will consider your deeds, before he ever looks at your deeds, because we know at some time he will, right? We're going to go to heaven, it says, and our works, our deeds are going to be tried by fire, and only those deeds that pass through the fire will be accounted unto you as righteousness, yes? We, we, do, we know, do we need to do some revelation study? Right? So there is a time that our deeds will be looked at. But before our deeds are ever looked at, before we're ever looked at, did we keep the Ten Commandments, God's going to look at our heart. He's going to look at our heart. He says, did, did the deeds that you did in the flesh come out of a 100% pure heart. Did you do what you did for the Lord? For the Lord? Or for self-promotion? Did you help the person across the street? Because they needed to get across the street and you loved them and you cared for them? Oh, so that you could take a selfie. Good deed for the day. He's talking about the motives of the heart. Did you do the deeds of the law because you loved God? Or did you do them so that you could earn and deserve something later down the road? Oh, my God. So from the viewpoint of God, there are none that are righteous, right? Not a single one. None of us can do anything good enough that would deserve or earn righteousness. And this is a superficial view of God by this rich young ruler. He's coming assuming that he can do something to inherit or earn 
eternal life. So now I want to go back to the previous story of the children. Notice the contrast in language between the rich young ruler and the children who were brought to Jesus. Right? The disciples said, don't bother the master with these little ones. Jesus says that that kind of language displeased him. Well, how did the children approach Jesus? They simply wanted to be in his presence. They simply wanted a hug. They simply wanted a touch. And they ran to him empty-handed. They had nothing to offer back. They had nothing to give to Jesus to get from Jesus. Did they? Children don't. You know, parents, just going to give you a heads up. You have young kids, and it comes around to your birthday or Christmas. You're going to be sorely disappointed by their Christmas gifts. Because they have no money. All right? Your Christmas gifts and birthday gifts are going to be pieces of paper with some sort of crayon on it. Not distinguishable at all what it is, but they're going to tell you it's a drawing of you and them. Right? But now you just spent $500 on them for Christmas, and in no way does it equate. Right? And this is why these two stories are together. The rich young ruler came believing that he deserved something from Jesus based upon what he gave to Jesus. I've, give, I've obeyed your laws. I've done all these things. I deserve this. So the rich man is looking for a way to do something that will make him worthy to inherit the kingdom. He's still looking to the law, and he doesn't understand that children have no concept of law. The children have no concept of law. Children have no concept of look both ways before they cross the street. They're just going to run out in traffic. They don't know the laws of life, the laws that rule. Kids don't, kids don't really know right and wrong until we teach them right and wrong. Children simply want attention. Attention. So I've been working, I've been working the day camp this summer with some of the kids and the, the amount of attention that these kids need is almost overwhelming to me. Like by the end of the day, I don't have enough energy to spread across all these kids that just want attention, attention. So <laughs> look what we have here. We have come as kids not as someone who believes that they're good enough, that they've done enough works. Just, just want Jesus, not what he could give you. Here's the, here's the parallel. Jesus, before he sets forth any gospel, he goes straight to the law. He says, what do you have to do to inherit the kingdom of God? You have to know the law. Check, the young man knows the law. I know the law. I know everything you said. I've done it all. Then he sets before him something called the second table of the law. That's the part of the law which refers to our interactions as human beings. The first commandment talks about our relationship with God. Anybody know what the first commandment is? Thou shalt have no other God before thee, God Jehovah, right? Second, thou shalt make no graven images. Thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Those are how we relate to God. From there, it goes on with prohibitions against murder, theft, adultery, covetousness, false witness, and the rest. Jesus starts with the second part. He starts with the second part. He goes, let me put it this way. I'm going to start with the easy part, the easy stuff. You know the law. You know the law. Thou shalt not commit murder. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Right? We're, we're talking about those ones. Now, maybe all of us in here today could say, I've done that. I've never killed anybody. I've never murdered anyone. And this man, just like you, is like, yeah, look, I did it. I've done all those things. And this guy's like, yes, thank God, I've got eternal life, I've kept all these things. And Jesus says, 
Uh, so he says, I've never committed adultery. I've never stolen anything. I've never murdered anybody. I'm not a covetous person. All these things I've done, I've kept the law. I've kept the, I've kept the Decalogue. It's written on my heart. And Jesus kind of like, sir, you haven't kept these since the time you woke up this morning. <laughs> I'm going to tell you in here today, if you think you could brag about never murdering somebody, you're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. Because we got to look back at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus explains to the people that even if you've never actually taken a human life, but you've been angry with someone without just cause. Dude, this just happened to me like yesterday. Yesterday I was pulling out of the church parking lot here. I wasn't really paying attention. I, had, I was like maybe filling with my radio or something. And I was about to pull out onto Eminem Road. And then I looked up and I caught there was a car out of the corner of my eye. And I slammed on my brakes because I would have hit him. I would have hit him. And I just went like this, my bad, just like that, my bad. I didn't see him. Yo, that dude. <laughs> Cussing me out. <laughs> Flipping me the bird. Now I'm pissed. <laughs> right? At first I was like, yo, my bad, like I didn't see you. No harm, no foul. But now you're going to cuss me out on my own property. I wanted to chase him down. I wanted to beat him down on the side of the road. I wanted to, right? All that happened, I'm like, I wanted, a, I wanted a fist fight. I did. I wanted to. It was there. According to the Sermon on the Mount, it's murder. If you've ever hated someone, it's murder. If you've insulted him, broken the law against them emotionally, it's murder. If, listen, if, if you want to brag that you've never done it. Now, we understand it's not. But in your heart it is. Every time, the reason why Jesus did the Sermon on the Mount, it was because there was a bunch of people who were bragging about their ability to keep the law. Now, he was not saying, if you've ever had a bad thought, you've murdered people. No, he's saying, if you want to brag about being perfect, but you have an ugly heart, you're just as bad. That's what he's saying. The rich young ruler didn't understand. He had a superficial understanding of what it meant to be good. He had a superficial understanding of the law. He still harbored the hope within himself that he could earn his way into heaven and family. He's no different from the mass, mass majority of people in our society today and people who go to church every Sunday. Ponder this question, don't shout it out, but ponder this question in your heart. If you were to die tonight and stand before God and God said to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Now, let's, just, let's just zoom in on this. If you were to die tonight, stand before God, and God said to you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? 80% of people, 80% of people, when interviewed, gave an answer that we call works righteousness. They would say something like, I've tried to live a good life, I'm not a criminal, I've never murdered anybody. I go to church every Sunday, or almost every Sunday. I've been to Sunday school. I'm a deacon. I'm an elder. I'm a minister. I'm a pastor. That's the answer that 80% of people would get. They're relying upon their performance, their good deeds, their obedience to the Bible to get into heaven, and you would be wrong. You would be wrong because there is only one way to eternal life, and that is through Jesus Christ. 
It has never been based on your obedience. It was based on his obedience. The only obedience that we have to follow to get into eternal life is Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. Now, there is an expectation on the tail end of that. There is an expectation that once you've done that, you are now committed to the body of Christ to learn, to grow, mature, and that behavior catches up to the belief. That is the hope, okay? But we can't put that first and make that the way. If you stand before the Lord and he asks you, why should I let you into my heaven? There's only one answer. Because I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. It can never be about me. It always has to be about Jesus. If it was about anything other than Jesus, it technically wouldn't be fair. There's only one source that we can all come to. One door. Right? There's one door. But notice Jesus does not give this man a lecture. He doesn't say to him, no, you haven't kept the law. You idiot. You're so stupid. You don't know nothing. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. And this is, this is why it changed my mind. It changed my mind how this guy was actually coming to Jesus. He was actually trying to understand, and Jesus is trying to explain to this man God's requirements. After this man says, I have kept all of this since I was a youth, it says that Jesus, looking at him, loved him. I love that. I love that. Because this young man could not be more wrong. He could not be more wrong. He couldn't have missed the mark any bigger. But Jesus, looking at him, loved him. He could have tore this guy apart. He could have tore his theology all apart. But looking at him, loved him. The young man says to Jesus, who is the judge of heaven and earth, who is standing right in front of him, I've kept all of your laws. I've kept everything that you wrote. And Jesus, looking at him, loves him. I'm going to tell you today in this room, I don't care how far you've messed up or how bad your theology is. I don't care if you're an atheist and you don't believe anything I'm saying. If you're watching me online, you came across this, you're like, I don't believe in God. It doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. He loves you. It doesn't matter whether you reject him or deny his existence. He loves you. He loves you. Looking at him, loved him. And why does he love him? Why does he love him? And that, that made me think. Does he love him because Jesus finally found an Israelite who actually has kept all the law? Did he finally find someone who has, with their heart, worked really, really hard to be this perfect person since he was a little boy? Did Jesus love this guy because he was so lovely? And for the first time in my study of this story, I saw that I don't believe that the rich young ruler was an arrogant man. Now listen, his answer was implicitly arrogant, but I don't think that his demeanor was. I don't think that he was approaching with an attitude of arrogance. I really do believe that he was coming to get what he deserved. That he worked his whole life. I mean, let's think about this for a second, guys. We come to church every week. We believe Jesus Christ is Lord. We go to heaven. We stand before God. He opens the book of life. You expect your name to be there, don't you? I expect to receive my inheritance for doing what you told me to do. Same as this moment. This man has done what he was taught to do. Can I have my inheritance? Can I please have eternal life? 
<laughs> I think when our Lord meets people as lost as this young man who do believe that it's about keeping the law, his heart is filled with compassion. I think Jesus wanted to like put his arm around this guy and say, hey man, you don't understand anything. Thank you. Thank you for your heart to do this your whole life, but someone taught you wrong. The only way you get into the kingdom is if you bring nothing in your hand. You have to be like one of those little kids. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You couldn't possibly deserve it. You have to receive it. And it is by grace and grace alone that you receive eternal life. This is why these two stories are side by side. Jesus points back to the children who just want his presence. And this guy wanted to impress him. You're not going to impress me. I just want you to love me. I've kept the law since I was a boy. And Jesus replies, you've kept the law, but let's put it to the test. Now let's get to this part. Let's put it to the test. There's one thing you lack, Jesus says. You've done all these things all your life. But you're going to miss out on the, your inheritance because of one thing. One requirement. All you have to do is go back home, sell everything, give it to the poor, pick up your cross, and follow me, and then you'll inherit the kingdom of God. Now hear me very carefully. Hear me very carefully. Hear me, hear me very carefully. Jesus was not setting the universal rule for everybody to get to heaven. He was not saying... Every single one of us has to be financially poor in order to get into heaven. That's not what this story is. Oh, it makes me so mad. It makes me so mad when people try to preach that. This is this guy. This is this man's story. This is Jesus' interaction with this man. Jesus knew this man's heart. He knew that this man had a love of money. He loved money so much that there wasn't enough room for God. We could, we could change this from rich young ruler to whatever kind of ruler. Car young ruler. Cars could be your God. Sports could be your God. That's all we're simply pointing out is anything that you're not willing to lay down in order to follow Jesus. Who always want to make it about money. Everyone wants to make it about money. It wasn't necessarily about the money. It was about the heart behind the money. It's about the thing that he couldn't give up. I mean, this guy was consumed with money. You've kept the law, but let's start with number one. Thou shalt not have any other God before thee, God Jehovah. Jesus knew that this man's God was money. He knew it. Okay, yeah, he went to church on Sunday, but as soon as he was out... Bam, back to making money. Or maybe he ended up getting a job on a Sunday. Now he couldn't come to church anymore. I'm just throwing some stuff out there. Not trying to step in anybody's business. I'm just saying. Money was this man's idol. What would his final estate be? What would his money be ranked? Where would he be? Would he be, would he be a, 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 um, one of the wealthiest men? In the world would be Forbes' top businessman. So Jesus says this. There might be something in your life. And a lot of people, it's TV. Whatever you're watching on TV. A lot of us. A lot of us spend more time watching TV than we do talking to God. Just think about that for a second. Whatever you put on, turn on, look at, before you talk to God... According to the law, you've made it your God. Thou shalt have no other God before the God. Nothing else should have your attention before God. Again, we're talking about the law. We're talking about this guy doing something to earn and deserve. So Jesus says, get rid of it. 
Pluck out the eye that is looking at the wrong thing. Cut off the hand that's trying to steal. Whatever keeps you from the kingdom of God, get rid of it. That's all you have to do. <laughs> if you want to deserve it. If we're talking about your works. If we're talking about your works, you got to pluck it out, you got to cut it off. Come on, somebody. After Jesus' words, the rich young ruler's sighs of relief were transformed into groans of despair. The Bible says that he was sad at his word. He was sad at his word. And the word sad there is not strong enough. It, he was downcast. In the Greek it says that he was appalled. He was shocked by the words of Jesus. He was devastated. My whole life, I believe this one thing. And in an instant, you're saying it's not enough. I've worked so hard. This man ran to Jesus, but he walks away in sorrow. He walks away from Jesus who the Bible calls him the pearl of great price. The pearl of great price. The one who he should have been willing to invest it all in. Wouldn't invest a nickel. He walks away. He walks away from the greatest purchase he could have made. He walks away from the greatest investment he could have ever made. He walks away. The treasure of heaven. And he walks away from it. Family, here's the point to the story today. You can't earn, you can't deserve, and you can't buy eternal life. Like a child, you must come empty-handed to God and receive the free gift of eternal life. Now listen, we're not talking about possessions. Man, God wants you blessed. He wants you the head and not the tail, above only and never beneath. Right? He wants all those things for you. He, he wants you to be healthy and strong. He wants all those things. But when we're talking about eternal life, he wants you to come like a kid. God, I just want you. I want to be in your presence. There was one thing this man had standing in the way of receiving from God, and that was the love of his money. There may be things in your life that are not inherently a sin, but they do stand in the way of you being fully committed to God. I think too busy is a big one. I think too busy is a really, really, really big idol that stands in the way of people. Too tired. Too tired. By the time I get home from work and blah, 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 it's too tired. Mm. Just like this rich young ruler, there might be something that you need to let go of so that you can come grab a hold of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I don't know where you stand in your faith today. Maybe you've been on the outside watching. Maybe you've been a believer for a long time. But you're still stuck in that mix of, am I the Lord's or do I just have a piece of the Lord? Am I sold out to, to God and, and eternal life or do I just want him to bless me on what I'm choosing to do? It's a big, big difference. Big difference. One is a God of convenience and one's a God of covenant. And he won't be both. He won't be both. He won't be a quickie God. <laughs> if you're here today, or watching online, and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I want to offer that to you today. And please don't run out as soon as this is done. We have one more thing that we need to complete today. But if you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you've never let go of those things that have been distracting you from eternal life, and you've never grabbed a hold of Jesus, he is the way, the truth, and the life. That's it. The only one way to eternal life, and that's through Jesus Christ. You've never done that. You've never taken that step. 
That would be that big step of faith. That would be the measure of faith that it takes. The faith in Jesus. To make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. We want to offer that to you today. And just like Romans 10.9 says, we have to confess it with our mouth and believe in our heart. And if you want to confess that today, would you pray this with me? And because we love you, we love to pray it out loud. It goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at familychurchny.com to get started today.